broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bobby Rains. I'm here for our regular Investors Observer Members Only Workshop. Uh, welcome. All right, here is our agenda for today. We're going to look at some charts. We'll talk a little bit about what else is happening in the economy and the stock market. We'll look at some things that are hot in the market right now. And then the rest is member driven content. We got a bunch of good questions ahead of time uh, this time. Oh. You know, we always get good questions ahead of time, but I got more than usual this time. So thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Um, as always, you can put questions in during the presentation in the question box. Uh, you know, I have two screens here, so I usually keep one eye on the questions. So if you have something that's about what I'm talking about in the moment, go ahead and throw it in there. And sometimes I'll, you know, get to it right then. Otherwise, you know, things will just be there and I will get to them at the end. All right. so. To the charts. Uh, this is the last year of the S&P 500. Um, we've had a pretty good breakout above this range, uh, you know, here uh, over the last couple of weeks. The last two days have been have been red, um, but you know, this was a pretty a pretty sizable breakout. That's a lot of green candles in a row there. Um, without much in the way of adjustments, this isn't anything I'm super concerned about. Uh, you know, that it comes coincident with some hotter than expected inflation data is, you know, is it a catalyst for a pullback that we needed technically, or is it a bigger problem? We'll talk about a little bit later, but I'm not super concerned about it at this point anyway. All right, the NASDAQ has a pretty similar look. It's got a few more red candles and the down days, the last couple of days have been bigger. But it's also gotten, I think, a little bit more extended in terms of if you want to measure, say, the distance from the 50 or the 100 day moving average here. Um, we go back to the S&P 500 and then look at the NASDAQ. You can see this these days here were just a lot steeper um, in terms of getting getting up and getting away from things. So, again, right, not super concerning. We'll we'll see what develops, um, but it generally looks pretty good as far as I can tell. All right. Let's move on. Yeah, so the Russell, this is actually where things get interesting because we were in this range here for basically all of 2020. And now we have broken out of it since the last time. Um, so that's pretty nice. Again, though, there's some some big candles that represented pretty significant jumps. Um, you know, we went up pretty far, pretty fast, and this resistance had been pretty strong. So it's not super surprising just from a technical standpoint, ignoring the news to kind of kind of see this happen here. Um, so, you know, again, but it is, it is nice to see us break out of that range. Um, hopefully that will be the start of the new <clears throat> A new rally and that old top will uh, will serve as you know support if we do pull back. All right, so the S and P 500 versus the S and P 500 equal weight, not super different. The one thing that I will note is that this down leg here on the cap weighted index is a little bit bigger than it is on the equal weight, um, and that the equal weight continues to outperform uh, over the past year. But this again comes on the heels of the 2020 year where those top five stocks in the S&P 500 by market cap really pushed things a lot higher. So um, and this is a little bit of catch up. Uh, it may be frustrating for, you know, Apple investors to wonder why, you know, why isn't Apple carrying the entire market higher? But, um, you know, the rest of the, uh, the, the 495 or whatever, as it were, um, are holding up relatively well here. Uh, that's what that is. All right, so growth versus value is actually where it gets interesting in terms of the last couple of days. You can see the big, right, look how steep growth has been here, um, which is the blue line, very steep, and then a much bigger pullback. Um, again, right, when you start to see lines get super steep on charts, um, 
typically that's the sort of thing that doesn't last for very long and you're going to get some kind of moderation, whether it's just flat and sideways for a while or a pullback and then, you know, normally a continued rally, you could go either way. Um, but this long, steep line here is the sort of thing where people talk about things deserving a correction or being due for a con correction. It's stuff like that. Whereas the, you know, value stocks, the white line here, um, as you would typically expect, the value stocks tend to be less value, less volatile, um, right? Not up as much, but not down as much over the last couple of days either. All right. So the big news since the last time we did this is the Federal Reserve meeting where they announced their taper schedule. They're going to start buying fewer bonds every month um, until basically the middle of next year when they'll be buying none because um, they're just going to step down. <clears throat> um, they said they could adjust that, et cetera. They might. We'll see. Um, one thing that I think is worth noting is I've highlighted here 2014 which was the last time the Fed tapered an asset purchase program. Um, and you can see there that what happened is that bond yields actually fell, uh, which is interesting because one of the things, right, people expect to get out of quantitative easing is the Fed is buying bonds, it should push rates lower. Um, I think what it really does is it pushes expectation of rates lower. Um, and that's a slight difference, but it's an important difference because I think everybody expects, and I'm jumping my bullet points here, um, but everyone sort of expects that the Fed won't raise rates while they're still buying bonds. Um, and so the taper and the pace of the taper is a suggestion about when interest rate hikes might happen. And if you, let's just finish up this last bullet point here. Uh, if you look at the pace of tapering, it should end at pretty much in the middle of next year. And then the rate first rate hike is generally expected to be about the middle of next year, maybe the third quarter. Um, so that, that all lines up pretty well. All right, so again, treasury yields fell during the last taper. Um, I don't think we're gonna see a 100 basis point drop uh, this time around. First of all, I, yeah, I don't think the 10 year is going to, you know, 0.5, practically zero um, anytime soon. So, so just that seems unlikely to happen. Um, but generally, I don't think this is a, a signal that we're at some kind of interest rate lift off. Uh, real yields, uh, you know, if you look at like tips or something like that, those yields are also falling recently. Um, you know, in the same way we're seeing we're seeing this pullback here. Um, but what what this does do is so asset the the Fed's asset purchase program is essentially a swap. Um, they're taking, you know, bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, sort of off of financial institution balance sheets, and exchanging them for Fed reserves. Um, and so the thing about Fed, uh, you know, Federal Reserve reserves, reserves held at the Federal Reserve, um, is they are risk-free. So for capital requirements, even a treasury, a bank has to have some amount of capital to offset the treasury a bond um they don't for fed reserves um so it frees up capital for lending um reserves also specifically or in particular for non-bank financial institutions return no yield um so it encourages lending because that's money that's on a balance sheet that's getting no returns so if you're running you know some kind of hedge fund or some other non-bank financial institution you can swap bonds with a basically no yield for, you know, Fed reserves, which have some yield, um, or for Fed reserves, which have no yield, but then you have money that you can do other things with and maybe try to get a higher yield. Um, so this also, there's been a lot of talk in certain circles recently about the Fed's reverse repurchase facility. The taper will help dry up some of that liquidity. So those of you who've been watching that, uh, number um you should start to see that sort of some of that liquidity that gets soaked up by that facility get uh just generally sort of go down um as the taper happens because those reserves go out you know go back to the fed the bonds come back out of the fed and then they're sitting there and they don't have to do this weird uh, reverse repurchase transaction to try to get a security with some yields on a balance sheet all right
Earnings update. Uh, results overall have been better than expected. Uh, revenue is rising. Um, this is due to a couple of things. One is increased demand. Uh, the other is price increases. Um, we'll talk more about price increases on several subsequent slides. But if you're just looking at revenue numbers, those are the two things that uh, push revenue up, right? You're either selling more or you're selling at a higher price or in some cases both. Um, Earnings, which is you know revenue minus expenses, have also generally been better than expected. Uh, the caveat there is that earnings are always better than expected. Um, there's a you know a thing that happens every quarter where companies release guidance and then analysts put expectations on top of those, and they always miss low. Um, just always, always, always. Not not always for every company, but if you look across a group of <clears throat> You know, if you look at the market, analysts are consistently low. Now, it turns out that in this case, they are lower or the results are higher uh, compared to the estimate than the average. So when I say better than expected, I don't just mean better than the estimate because they're always better than the estimates. Um, in this case, they're actually better than the estimate by more than normal. <clears throat> uh, some companies are absolutely getting smacked around after earnings. Uh, sometimes it's due to an earnings miss. More often, it's been due to like sort of weak guidance, companies talking about supply chain issues, things like that. Um, you know, the thing about owning a stock is what you're really buying is some claim on future earnings. So what happened last quarter is good to know, but matters way less than what the company expects to happen in future quarters. So if they say, you know, we missed earnings by a little bit this quarter, but we expect to blow it out next time around. A lot of times the market is looks on that more favorable than, you know, we did better than expected this time around, but the future is starting to look shaky because, you know, a stock is really a bet on the future uh, of a company more so than the, the past, even the very recent past. All right, so what else is going on? Um, the Fed, really guesses about the Fed are to some degree driving markets. Um, I left some of this stuff in from last time, this particular chart about inflation expectations. Um, it really just shows that inflation expectations or inflation in actuality is consistent, has consistently been lower than expectations for the last 15 years. Um, we'll see where that happens in the future. This morning was a little bit of a surprise, uh, but it's one month's worth of data and there's a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, the other thing that I feel like is really important about inflation, um, particularly when we talk about in terms of the Fed, is that a lot of the price increases we're seeing right now are due to weird sort of idiosyncratic economic shocks, right? Like we all know about the you know ships backed up at Los Angeles and then they get the containers off the ship and there's not enough truckers to take the containers out of the port into other places. Um, there's not an interest rate from the Federal Reserve that unloads the boats faster, right? Or moves, you know, brings more trucks to the port, okay? So the shortages we're seeing aren't solved by raising interest rates. Um, the the sort of more fundamentally, the thing that's causing the inflation we have, we're seeing right now is that demand for goods is much, much higher than the previous peak. Um, you know, you can look, there's various places to look for the data. I didn't find a chart for this today. Um, but yeah, the, the number of containers moving through those ports on the West Coast is higher than it's ever been before. Um, and so it's really just the, the port is operating at or above capacity. Um, services demand is still kind of lagging. So I would expect some of that to sort of balance out, um, right? People were stuck at home and they couldn't go and do things during the pandemic. There's still some of that going on. So they're buying things instead of spending money on going places and doing things. Um, the holidays complicate some of that normalization a little bit because obviously the Christmas holiday in America is generally, um, you know, generally a stuff buying holiday. Um, that's just kind of what it is. Um, so, you know, you may see some gift cards and other stuff like that this year uh, because of shortages or people just sort of shifting what they're doing. Um, but that complicates some of that normalization. But I expect, you know, 
assuming we get coronavirus to stay sort of on the wane, that we'll start to see some shift back to services and less goods. Um, and that should help some of the price pressure as it is. Um, the other thing, and we talked about this last time, you can go in and watch the replays. Inflation isn't necessarily bad for stocks. Um, measures to fight inflation can be bad for stocks, right? Like raising the cost of funding a company can be bad for the stock. Um, you know, we talked last time about how short-term inflation can actually lead to higher margins, which is nominally good for stocks. Uh, so inflation isn't necessarily the bad thing here. Um, the best outcome of all of this is really that industry and government take advantage of low interest rates and build more capacity into the system. Um, <clears throat> if you think about sort of what causes inflation, it's about an imbalance between supply and demand, right? So prices rise because there's not a balance between supply and demand, whether it's too much demand or not enough supply, one of those causes inflation. Um, so higher interest rates suppress demand, but they suppress demand by weakening the economy, right? You, you raise interest rates, companies stop growing, they have to stop hiring, people lose jobs. Um, that's not good. Uh, so what you really want to see happen here is we want to actually build an economy that can run at a higher capacity, um, meet higher demand with new supply, as opposed to having to have monetary policymakers come in and right, try to tamp down demand by raising interest rates. Um, right, what we'd like to have is uh, higher, you know, better capacity. We can meet that demand uh, with increased supply and we'll, we'll see how that works out. But I think that that is also what the Fed thinks. Um, and that's why they're being very, I don't wanna say casual, um, but not being as proactive as I think a lot of people would like is, because it is in the, over the long term really much better to have an economy that has a higher output capacity, uh, which may mean some instability in prices in the short term than it is to come in and cause a recession, which would absolutely, right, if you tamp down demand, you absolutely can get rid of a lot of these short, short, shortages, but I don't think causing recession is really what anybody wants uh, right now either. All right, so energy prices are another thing that's been a big deal recently. This chart is, uh, it's the a data series known as the Baker Hughes rig count. Baker Hughes is an oil field services company. This is essentially the number of rigs operating in North America. Um, you can see here's the pandemic. It dropped off. We all remember oil trading at negative, uh, you know, settling at a negative uh, value for that futures contract in what is that, April of 2020 or so? Um, the number has started to, to climb back up, but you can see we're still way below sort of the, the pre-pandemic normal. Um, and that's really, yeah, that's, that's why energy prices are rising right now. Um, energy prices tend to lag uh, rig counts because, I mean, if you're just thinking about the process of drilling for oil, you have to drill for oil and then you have to start pumping oil. That oil has to get to a refinery and be refined into some product that you can put in your car. Um, all of that takes time. So rig counts tend to be sort of, uh, you know, ahead of prices. So as this keeps going up, um, prices will keep going up. Also, as prices keep going up, more rigs will come online um, because all the oil drillers know exactly where their break even is and there really isn't, um, you know, as the prices go up, you'll get more. Uh, so really this is another case of demand just coming back up from the pandemic faster than supply. One thing I will point out here though, is this huge drop, uh, you know, 2014 into 2016 in the number of rigs. Um, so we had the big fracking boom coming out of the 2008 crisis. This was due to low interest rates, new technology, things like that. Um, but a lot of oil companies spent a lot of money buying up land and drilling for oil and gas. Um, and a lot of them did it with borrowed money. And so this period here, right, there's a ton of rigs operating. There's a ton of oil getting pumped. Uh, gas prices were pretty low uh, in this stretch um, and oil prices were too. And so what happened was 
companies that normally would have maybe said, hey, oil is too cheap, we should shut off, they had borrowed a bunch of money and they have to keep making bond payments. So they kept pumping oil um, until, yeah, until the system broke, right? Like the, the boom and bust oil cycle that everybody talks about is this right here, right? You boom going up, you pump oil even though you're losing money because you don't have anything else to do. You have to make those bond payments um, until eventually some companies started to go bankrupt and it all kind of collapsed uh, in 2014. Um, and then, you know, came back up again and then the pandemic knocked things down. But I don't expect us to get back to 1500 rigs operating anytime soon. Um, but, you know, somewhere closer to seven or 800 is probably more likely and we'll get there eventually. It's just, you know, gas prices are going to be a little high for a little while. All right, so the hot sectors right now, energy remains a big one. Uh, thermal coal um, is the top one. Thermal coal is interesting. Um, a couple of the sector or a couple of the industries, which are the, you know, the inset bullets here in the, you know, the smaller groups of companies in a given sector, um, a couple of them are just because there are relatively few companies. Thermal coal is one of those. There aren't a ton of thermal coal companies anymore. Um, and there has been big demand in places like China and a couple other places uh, as you know, shortages of oil and natural gas uh, shift the way people are producing energy around. Um, you get things like that. Uh, oil, the midstream oil and gas companies, which essentially means pipelines, uh, some of its storage, most of its pipelines, um, and then oil and gas integrated, which is basically everything from drilling to, uh, to sales. Those are your, you know, Exxon and companies like that. Somebody who might be, you know, drilling for oil and also selling it to you at the gas station is the, uh, the integrated oil and gas companies. Um, so, and by hot right now, what I mean is, let me dump out of these slides real quick here. Uh, if you go to our sector and industry tool and look at the short-term technical scores, these are the things that have been up the most in the last month or so. Um, and so energy, you can see here, it's thermal coal. But if we look at that, yeah, these companies are, a lot of them are pretty small and there aren't that many of them. Um, so a few doing really well will really, uh, really push that rating around. All right. Uh, yeah, real estate was next. Uh, residential real estate still on top. Um, industrial is next. A lot of that is warehouse and storing and storage, uh, which is again back to supply chains and things like that. Um, new to the list this week is the uh, retail sector. Uh, retail REITs had not been doing particularly well. Um, but they are starting to come back. I think we're probably past the any wave of bankruptcies or lease workouts uh, in retails. Um, you know, in the, in the actual retailers, uh, you know, who pay rents in malls and places like that. I think we're past whatever pandemic uh, damage may have caused there. Um, and so some of those companies that were maybe a little bit oversold are starting to snap back a little bit. Financial services is back. Uh, the first group is, yeah, the first group there is actually supposed to be diversified financial services, which is <coughs> me, essentially companies that are in financial services that don't have a lot of, or don't have a particular concentration in any one, um, any one line of business. That's another, uh, yeah, financial conglomerates. That's another one where the list is very small, right? There's only, what is that, five companies? Um, so, you know, none of them are doing bad, but it is kind of a, uh, it's kind of an unusual group and it's not as uh, not as broad as some of the other, um, some of the other ones. Uh, uranium, another small group, but also, yeah, uranium prices have just been going crazy recently. Um, I don't understand that exactly because there isn't a ton of new nuclear power capacity coming online. Um, that's the sort of thing that seems like it would take forever to get up and running. So demand, yeah. I don't really understand the uranium market. Um, it's a thing that's been hot for, I guess, a couple months now. I guess if it stays hot, I'll have to figure it out. But um, yeah, those stocks have been doing real well for the last couple of weeks, uh, the last couple of months even. 
Um, and then rental and leasing, which is, again, a lot about supply chains and things opening up and things like that. And then marine shipping, which is, again, more supply chains. Um, consumer cyclical has been on this list for a while, but the mix keeps changing. Uh, leisure, resorts, and, cas and casinos are both broadly, I would say, kind of in the travel space. Um, you know, that is, we talk about that mix of services versus goods. Uh, people going to resorts and casinos is people who are not ordering stuff on Amazon that has to come from China in a container. Um, so that is part of that shift back to that kind of thing. Um, resorts and casinos also include some of these companies that are doing, you know, have online gambling apps now. Uh, I don't think that's every state, but I know in Virginia where I am, there's three or four or maybe five of them and they advertise constantly. So I assume there must be a lot of people signing up to bet on sports or on their phones. Um, so that's another reason that those companies, those stocks might be rising. And then auto and truck dealerships also, right? There has been a shortage of new cars. Prices are going up. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about a lack of discounts. Um, you know, I mean, if you think about every car commercial you've ever seen, most of them discuss, you know, some discount that they're giving you. Uh, you know, if you come come now, right, like Toyota Thon or Truck Month or any of those promotions are about a sale and they're just not doing that this year. Uh, so margins should be higher there. Also, the used car market is really hot because there's, right, you can't make, if you can't make new cars, one place that you can make up some, uh, some capacity is in used cars by just offering higher prices for used cars. So, so that's another place where the uh, just margins are getting higher because prices keep rising. All right, so on to the questions. Uh, Marcin had a question about Clorox. Um, so briefly something about a Unilever buyout, but it disappeared. Um, I, yeah, I couldn't find it either. Um, so let's talk about Clorox first. Uh, yeah, I couldn't find anything about that rumor. Um, Clorox is an interesting company because it was a big winner early in the pandemic, right? Like everybody wanted to sterilize things and buy cleaning supplies and lots of stuff like that. Um, and a lot of those got used, but I think a lot of what happened was it just sort of shifted a lot of sales forward. People may have bought a bunch of things that they didn't use as fast as they expected to. And so, you know, if you bought a, if you bought nine bottles of bleach in the first quarter of 2020, um, you may still have a couple of those hanging around. So you probably haven't bought any since then. Uh, that kind of thing, I think, kind of happens. Um, it's right. Like I don't Clorox is the kind of thing that I don't expect it to ever go away. It's not a bad name if you want to hold it for a while. It pays a decent dividend. Um, I also think they're dealing with some supply chain issues. Um, and this is where Clorox in particular gets kind of weird. Um, we've seen a lot of these sort of consumer services and some of the like packaged food companies, Mondelez, some of those either enact price increases or announce future price increases. Um, Clorox gets complicated because of that, or at least what I believe to be some shifted forward buying. Um, Right, like I, I'm not. It's unclear to me how much they can raise prices if they're actually seeing weak demand for products because people have a lot of, you know, bleach or sanitizing wipes or whatever sitting around, um, you know, in their houses from early in the pandemic. All right, so the rest of this question is also interesting. Um, so the idea about, you know, sort of weird gossips moving stocks around um seems like a reason to watch kathy wood and reddit uh you know those things are absolutely moving stocks around um yeah, you, you can read the rest of your stuff so kathy wood is interesting um she runs the arc funds it's like arkk and arkg and several other funds and so they're they're generally speculative technology so there's one for some space stuff and one for biotech but Generally, it's a very speculative technology kind of thing. Um, and that generally tends to be a high risk, high reward strategy. Um, one of the nice things about the ETFs uh, is that for a high risk, high reward strategy, what you typically want to do is spread your money around. Um, 
right? You can go all in on a couple of stocks, but if you guess wrong, um, you might both miss a big winner, but also hit a big loser. Um, so the idea, one of the nice things about an ETF that has a whole bunch of stocks is you don't have to necessarily nail the winner. Um, but if you get three or four winners, it should more than make up for the losers because, right, a stock that goes up 400% cancels out four stocks that go down 100%, right? Assuming, you know, obviously adjusting for position size, but um, that's a lot harder thing to do in a, you know, in a, you know, individual portfolio. Um, but certainly, you know, she has been an interesting person to watch and her funds have done pretty well, although I don't think they're they're still not as high as where they were, I think, late last year or early this year. Um, so the Reddit thing is interesting uh, to lump in with Kathy because they buy a lot of the same stocks, right? Tesla is very popular on Reddit. Tesla is very popular with Kathy Wood. Um, but I think they're buying them for different reasons. Uh, so, right, things like short squeezes. This is a store I used to like to go to. Um, the CEO said something funny on Twitter. Uh, those are not things that get a stock put in a Kathy Wood portfolio. Those are absolutely things that get stocks run up and down on Reddit. Um, so certainly keep an eye on those things can you know tell you what stocks are gonna go up and down in the short term. Um, but they're, they're sort of very different reasons, right? Like I don't think, yeah. GameStop or some of the other things that that ran up and down in the meme stock craze, but don't have any sort of potentially groundbreaking technology. Uh, Tesla and a couple of other tech stocks are interesting because they kind of appear in both categories. But I think Kathy Wood is buying Tesla because she believes in a future that has a lot of electric cars. And I think a lot of people on Reddit are buying Tesla because they might believe in a future with a lot of electric cars, but they also think that uh, Elon Musk is funny and cool and like what he says on Twitter. Um, so like I said, right, these are very different reasons to maybe buy the same stock. All right, so Larry said HTZZ, which was Hertz relisted, and uh, I think this was yesterday or possibly Monday. The week kind of runs together at a certain point. Um, it relisted earlier this week and HTZZ, which was trading over the counter, became HTZ trading on the NASDAQ. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what Larry was seeing in his account because I didn't have the stock. Um, but if you go and look up HTZZ in any brokerage account now, it won't really show you anything because HTZZ has been delisted and isn't trading anymore. Um, so yeah, the stock just moved and changed the listing. Uh, so if you had HTZZ in your account, it may take a couple of days for it to get replaced by HTZ because of clearing transactions and some things like that. But you you shouldn't actually, right, like those shares shouldn't be zeroed out and go to zero. You should just, you know, it should just be a, a one for one. Your Hertz, Hertz OTC shares should become Hertz NASDAQ shares and that should be it. Um, All right, so Muhammad had a question about TQQQ and SOXL. Um, how risky are they? What is the best time to buy? So both of these are what is known as leveraged ETFs or levered ETFs. Um, both of these are, I believe, triple levered, which means that they provide three times the daily percent return. If QQQ goes up 1%, TQQQ will go up 3%. Uh, where this gets interesting is to the downside. Um, if T T if QQQ goes down 1%, TQQQ will usually go down about 3%. Um, you only have to sort of play with potential scenarios there a little bit to realize that a 33% decline in QQQ would give you a 100% decline in TQQQ. Um, granted, it's unlikely for that to happen in a single day, uh, but these things are pretty volatile. They move around a lot. Um, and so these are things you trade. That's not something you buy and hold. Uh, they're too volatile. And they also, because of the weird 
nature of them. There's a bunch of derivatives and other things going on underneath the hood. They typically have sort of a higher fee, so they don't really actually perform at three times the return of the uh, the underlying unlevered ETF. So, you know, if you want to trade these things based on whatever short-term thing you want to trade them on, that's fine. Um, but I I generally don't mess around with them because I don't have any, uh, yeah, um, I don't need to add leverage and volatility to my portfolio. All right. Uh, from Tim, he said, I'm invest investigating SAB Biotherapeutics. They have two ticker symbols, SABS, which is at $9, and SABSW, which is at 181 What's the difference? So SABS is a company that was taken public by a SPAC. Uh, SPACs were all the rage last year. There's still a few of them coming out this year. It stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Uh, what you do is you have an IPO, you raise money from investors, and then you go buy a company. So when you when you IPO, all you have is just a pool of money. So what the IPO buyers are basically doing is betting that the person running the SPAC can get a good deal and manage a company that will grow. Um, and typically the way that IPO works is they sell units. And the unit typically goes for about 10 bucks. Uh, and the unit contains a share and a warrant. Um, sometimes the warrant is a, to buy a piece of a share. In this case, it's to buy a whole share at a strike price of eleven fifty. Um, so the the warrants, every spec could write its own rules, but typically they can be exercised either after a merger happens or twelve months after the IPO, which in this case would be February. Um, so. It turns out, though, that with SABS trading at nine dollars, no, yeah, nobody wants to buy it for eleven fifty uh, if the stock is trading at nine. Um, so that warrant essentially is just an out of the money call option. Um, you can buy it at eleven fifty between now and I would guess February. I don't actually know when those expire. I couldn't couldn't find that information easily. Um, but yeah, that basically functions as a as an out of the money call option. But yeah, so you see a lot of these things now where there's a stock with a ticker and then a stock that has the same ticker with a W at the end of it. Um, and they have a lot of times a sort of similar price relationship. Uh, that is because a lot of these are formerly SPACs and uh, the W is a warrant. Um, <clears throat> All right, so Maureen asked about chip companies. <clears throat> um, they've grown a lot recently. They're all down today after the inflation report. All right, let's start there. Um, first of all, though, I wanna go and look at a couple of charts because I think this is good to know. Yeah. All right. So here's AMD. Um, NVIDIA is another one. Qualcomm is another one. Okay. So a thing you'll notice about all of these charts is, and AMD may be the one with the least, they all have these stretches here where the stock is going basically straight up. Um, as I said earlier, when we were talking about the indices, uh, vertical, you know, lines approaching vertical on a stock chart typically mean there's some kind of uh, you know, correction coming, right? So some, some sort of balancing out or lessening of that. Um, because yeah, stocks don't, stock prices don't just go straight up for very long. Um, so today's inflation data was a little bit unexpected. It was kind of a down day for the market. Um, so yeah, maybe people looked at a down day at the market and decided it was time to get out of some chip stocks they had big gains on. Um, I don't think they're, in, I don't see a good reason why higher than expected inflation would cause all the chip stocks to be down four, five, and six percent. Um, 
I think more likely it was they went down a little bit more than some other stuff because they were maybe a little bit more overbought than some other stuff. Um, so that's that. But the, yeah, right. So the other question is, should you get in now with these little dips? So it's not like these stocks are at a bargain, right? They're all trading pretty high. The peg ratios aren't terrible, um, you know, in terms of evaluation, but they're not it's not like this is an undiscovered part of the market, right? Like they're they're pretty high. They're at fair value or, or toward the high end. Um, so the interesting thing about this is everyone knows there's a shortage of chips, All right? So these companies, again, another place where nobody has to give anybody a discount, right? Like I can sell every microchip I can make and I could probably sell more than that if I wanted to, um, you know, or if I could make them. Uh, so what happens when you get that kind of market though, especially with things like semi semiconductors and less so with like the big chips, right? Like Nvidia and AMD in particular sell a lot of chips where people want a specific AMD chip or a specific Nvidia chip. Um, and those things are in, in short supply right now too. But with a lot of the, the stuff that goes into cars and things like that, sometimes those, there are two or three places you could get those from. And so what you see when there's a shortage is if I'm an automaker and I'm trying to get as many chips as I can, I might put in orders everywhere I can. I'll put in orders for 10 times more chips than I need because as soon as somebody starts filling my order, I can go cancel the orders I don't need, right? So what happens is you over order to try to get filled somewhere. Um, and so if you try to just look at, say, the order books, you know, companies are like, oh, we've got orders into 2025. Well, that's great. But how many of those will actually be there in 2025 when you're ready to deliver? That's hard to, to say. So people talk a lot about the bullwhip effect. And what that means is if you think about a bullwhip, right, you kind of snap it and the wave sort of travels down the whip and it gets actually much bigger at the other end than it is at the end where you start. Um so some of these shortages and supply chain things get sort of amplified as they go through the system. Um, and so, yeah, all of this is a long way of saying that I've been watching the chip thing for a long time and I don't actually have a good answer. Um, I don't think demand for microchips is going to go away. Um, all these companies are well capitalized and should keep growing. Um, is now a better or worse time to buy than two months from now? I don't know. Um, generally, as a long-term investor, I think the time you have excess cash is when you should probably look to buy. Um, and so if you were thinking about buying Friday of last week, today is absolutely a better chance than Friday was just because the price is lower. Um, but outside of that, I don't have a lot of insight because it seems very complicated. And, you know, I've read several articles and listened to a bunch of podcasts and all various things where people are discussing this exact scenario. And everyone seems to be like, I don't know, I guess we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Um, so that's a long way of giving you basically that same answer, which is, I don't know, I guess we'll see. But it'll be interesting in any case. All right, so the second half of this question, uh, what insight do you have to Web3 companies and blockchain companies? Uh, as I understand, the Ethereum needs it to make transactions. Thoughts on VYGVF and Riot as well. Um, all right, so Web3 is the thing that I have heard for the first time in probably the last month. Um, I've been aware of you know blockchain since Bitcoin came out in 2011 or 2012, whatever that was. Um, so, yeah, that's that. Um, it seems generally that things that some people are calling Web3 is what Mark Zuckerberg and other people who are running corporations would call the metaverse, which is essentially an idea that instead of sort of going to different websites or apps like Facebook or whatever, you could do a bunch of things in an app. And it doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, you can text your friend and also, you know, send them money, right? If you combined, I don't know, WhatsApp and Venmo, 
right? It, it doesn't mean that so much as there could be places uh, online that you might want to go, right? Like a lot of you could spend time in doing things and traveling around in the uh, yeah in the internet for for lack of a, a better way of explaining it. Um, so Ethereum is absolutely one of the blockchains that people are building some of these things on. Um, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting idea. Um, I have a hard time looking at Facebook and how much I see and hear people complaining about Facebook and thinking that they want a more immersive version of Facebook. Um, that's really more about metaverse than it is Web3 in particular. Um, I think the concept of Web3 is one that will grow. I think things like Roblox uh, and Fortnite are maybe better ways to think about some of these things. Where So <clears throat> Roblox is a company that makes essentially a platform for other people to make games. Um, and so you can go to Roblox and play a whole bunch of different games. And there's like a little internal economy to both Roblox and then to the uh, individual games themselves. Um, Roblox is not using blockchain that I'm aware of, but that's an example. Uh, Fortnite is another example of a thing where it's a game that people play, but they also have had, a, they've had, you know, concerts and other events so people can just sign on to the game and kind of hang out and do some social interaction in essentially inside of the universe that is created by the video game. Um, so, yeah, uh, I certainly think Web3 is a thing that's going to grow. Um, how it grows and what the investment opportunities are is opaque to me. Um, and we'll talk about that why in terms of the second half of this question, which is uh, these two stock tickers. Um, so blockchain companies. Um, one of the big things about blockchain and Bitcoin and all of these, uh, all of that sort of technology is that it's supposed to be decentralized, right? So no one really owns it. No one has control of it. Um, you know, the people who are using the ecosystem um, are the people who control it and have ownership of it. Um, and so with that as a starting point, you can imagine it's difficult to understand, right? Like what a blockchain company does, right? Like, so, okay, we have this big decentralized ecosystem and everybody who uses it shares in the ownership and also shares in the costs and hopefully the benefits. Did a company come in and own that blockchain? Like that, that seems to run counter to the idea of this technology. Um, and I tried to look at Riot in particular. Um, it seems like they're doing some interesting things, maybe, but I'm not sure what they're doing that is that couldn't be done not on a blockchain. Um, and it doesn't seem like they're doing anything that is groundbreaking or that no one else is doing. Uh, BYGVF is doing, essentially they're facilitating trade and payments, um, which again, seems like the sort of thing that I was to understand the blockchain got rid of, right? Like it was supposed to get rid of the need for a corporate financial infrastructure and return the power to the people. So the idea that you can buy stock in a company that will Right. Like you've just made a different set of financial institutions at that point. Right. Like uh, I, I don't. I'm either misunderstanding blockchain or I'm in misunderstanding what these companies are doing um, or. Possibly. These two things uh, fly in the face of each other. I'm it's unclear to me at this point which one of those is true. All right, uh, Brian, we have a whole bunch of articles that we published recently. Uh, some of them are in our learning center about blockchains and Bitcoin technology. That's probably the, the best place to look at it there. Um, I'm not, yeah, not the best 
person to explain it just sort of off the top of my head. Uh, all right, so, all right, we have a question about lots of talk about the metaverse, particularly Facebook changing its name. Um, yeah, all right, so I just talked about kind of the metaverse and the idea for a while. I don't necessarily think it's not a thing. I have, yeah, anytime a company changes its name after a bunch of bad news comes out about that company, I'm a little bit suspect. Um, so, yeah, as far as Facebook's role in the metaverse, I'll just leave it there. Um, they haven't actually announced any exciting metaverse initiatives or opportunities. So at this point, all they have is a different name in the same company. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, All right, uh, let's see, Ross says, do you see the inflation data having a long-term negative effect on turning the markets? Uh, Ross, um, I recommend you go watch the last workshop we did, which should be available probably in the investing tab of the website um, on the news page. Let me see here. Uh, Cause I did talk uh, at some length about how a personal finance tab, excuse me. Right here, members only workshop, October 20th. Um, I talked at some length during that presentation about uh, how inflation's can, inflation can affect the company's earnings, which is nominally what the stock price should be based on. Um, generally, I think the bigger risk there is, uh, you know, attempts to tamp down inflation as opposed to the actual inflation. Um, but also, yeah, demand demand for your company's things being very high feels like a thing that's generally not bad for a company. Um, okay, yeah, if you have questions about Investors Observer, uh, Ross, by all means, you can, I mean, you can send us a ticket and we can answer these offline using the help button or, um, yeah, that's what these workshops are for. So, you know, put it in the box and I'll try to get to it. Uh, um, let's see. I had a question about Apple. Um, Apple generally, I think, is in a weird spot. It, right, I forget exactly what the total return for 2020 was, but it was a lot. Um, the stock was up a ton and it's up by not a small amount this year. Um, it's also very much in the middle of all of this supply chain and chip shortage business. Uh, so there is absolutely more of a headwind to Apple's growth, I think, than there has been previously just because Right, as a company that can historically sell every phone it makes, um, they're going to be limited at this point by how many phones can they make, uh, which is going to cut into how fast they can grow. Um, so I, I do think there are some issues there, but I don't, I don't know. It seems the stock seems pretty happy for the last four or five months, kind of at this level. Um, I don't know why I would expect it to necessarily pull back from here. Um, now may be a good buying opportunity because it's been going sideways for a while. Um, it may pull back a little bit further. Um, you know, I wouldn't be super shocked to see that happen depending on how sort of the holiday season goes. Um, I also know a lot of people are very excited about the, some of the new computers and stuff that they've been making. So it's, uh, yeah. I don't think people are souring on Apple products. It's really just a question of how many things can they make and get in people's hands. That is going to be, I think, the big limiter of uh, of their sales, um, as opposed to you know anything else.
yeah, if you want to see one of those charts I mentioned earlier, just send me an email um, specifically for Kavork, but anybody else who wants to see one of those charts that I had earlier bigger, um, you can send me an email and I can email it back to you at the original size. Uh, just again, use that help button there and I'll, I'll get back to you that way. Just tell me which chart it was you're looking for. Um, we'll also be sending out a copy of the slides or you know, putting it on the website and you can probably zoom in on it there tomorrow. Um, that might be another way to get it too. I'm not sure uh, what's easier for you, but either one of those is fine. All right, are there any more questions? Um, I think I got to everybody. All right, well, like I mentioned a second ago, uh, this was recorded. We will be posting a video and the and a copy of the slides on the website uh, sometime tomorrow. Um, the next workshop will be, uh, let's see here, it looks like about December the 1st. Um, we'll probably have some pretty exciting things to announce then if we haven't announced them by email already. Um, so that'll be cool, look out for product announcements in your email, um, if not in the next workshop. Uh, let's see, Jill says renewable energy growth. Um, over the next decade, I absolutely think it's a big thing. Um, some of those, yeah, I keep watching the solar stuff and it's not done great this year, um, but you know, if you look at the last five years, uh, you know, this year's sort of correction and then sideways um, doesn't look surprising. Like, I do think that is the future. Everybody seems to want to get off of carbon. Um, and that means renewable is the uh, is the place to go. Um, but trying to sort those companies out and figure out what they do and stuff is very, very difficult. I think something like an ETF or Honestly, just sort of looking at the, you know, on the electricity side, especially um, some of the electricity companies have gotten in more into renewables than others. Um, those might be a good play, um, you know, and then some of them actually have spun out, uh, <clears throat> you know, essentially made uh, renewable energy, um, you know, put some renewable energy assets in another company and spun it out. So that company now, you know, basically just makes electricity and sells it and then pays a dividend. Um, so those are those are some things that are out there also. Uh, I think next era is I think one that has gotten relatively big into renewables. Um, yeah, so. They have a renewable sector. They do not really mention how big it is. Um, yeah, so including all of those things, they have 50 gigawatts. They don't break it out in their description. Um, but then next year also spun out this company, which essentially just owns some clean energy assets and pays a dividend. Um, so that's you know another way you can uh, you can get into something like that there. Um, yeah. All right. So supply chains creating shortages. 3D printing will be an option. I mean, 3D printing is interesting. I don't. Right. So if I'm a company right now and I'm having trouble getting some widget, uh, I'm not sure that it would be easier for me to get a 3D printer right now. Um, Right. Uh, going forward, will 3D printing, you know, I think I think a lot of industries have been moving toward that anyway. Um, I think it's possible you see more of that. You know, that makes manufacturing less labor intensive, which is the reason a lot of manufacturing went offshore to begin with. So if you could move that onshore, you can certainly, you know, you can avoid the port, avoid the port altogether. If you, you know, locate a thing in the United States and you can avoid a lot of those things, I think a lot of the in addition to more supply chain capacity, I think a lot of people are going to consider the sort of lean manufacturing process and try to figure out, you know, 
where they can maybe find some optimizations to that so they don't get uh, smacked by some kind of supply chain issue down the road. Um, and I think 3D printing could be an answer to some of that, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't imagine anybody is, you know, suddenly trying to start a factory with, with 3D printers because boats are slow, you know, containers are slow coming from China right now. Um, I think that's the sort of thing people look at in the future and you'll probably see some CapEx in that direction. But it's really hard to say that, like, you know, here's what the future of that is. But I mean, I do think, I think generally companies will look at a sort of all of the above approach. And I absolutely think 3D printing is a part of that is maybe the, the most concise answer I can give you in that regard. All right. So it is uh, pretty much past the time here. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off. But thank you all for coming. Thank you for subscribing to Investors Observer. Be on the lookout for that uh, recording tomorrow. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.